This morning we have Ken Wiest uh, returning. Ken has been in the Middle East for over uh, three decades and uh, teaching our brothers and sisters about uh, uh, ex instructing them and, and encourage them to uh, be uh, followers. So Ken, come on up and give us the word today. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everybody. Oh, wow. Very nice. Let's see. Let me start that. Good. You know, when I came back uh, to America, having been overseas for so many years, the only uh, news that I could see was CNN or BBC. <clears throat> and following the things that are going on in the States from a distance, you can still recognize various things that are occurring. But when you come back here and you actually live within it, it becomes a reality, and that's the provocative way I wanted to address you this morning. Is unity a swear word? Is unity a swear word? You, you stop and think about that in the political realm, like everybody just fights. Look at political ads, and the one number one word that everybody says is they will fight for you. They will fight for you. And then increase that with COVID-19 and then the vaccines and then the masks and how we're going to do this or not do this and who's going to do this. And if you do this, you're a puppet of the government. And if you don't, you're a... And so unity is almost like a swear word and it's gotten into the church through those pathways and maybe even other pathways. And yet Paul would say this to us this morning, without unity... The gospel will not spread. Amen. The gospel to be spread is beyond any one of us. It takes all of us to be unified. And Paul talks about that in Philippians this morning. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity <clears throat> to again return to this book. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us what you want us to know and understand. Help us to have uh, applying hearts and listening ears. And we pray these things in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. The last time I was here, I told you that we were going to go through the book of Philippians. I suggested to you that the, the theme of Philippians as a whole is all for Jesus, all for the gospel. All for Jesus and all for the gospel. Last time we looked at Philippians chapter 1 all the way up to verse 26... And the theme I suggested then was living for Christ and living for the gospel. If we live for Christ, if we live for the gospel, it changes how we pray. It changes the things that we will be thankful for. It changes us in terms of rejoicing in the fact that other people are sharing the gospel, even if their motives are not the best. And it allows us to say, I'm never going to be ashamed of Christ. Instead, Christ is going to be magnified magnified by my voice, not just in terms of living, but by my voice. <clears throat> this morning, we come to a long section. You're going to say, oh, is he going to get through all that? Don't worry, we're going to get through all this. The reason I put this all together is because I think it's all tied to this one theme, that effective gospel ministry requires a deep and a real unity. Effective gospel ministry requires a deep and a real unity. And he's going to seek to explain that in this entire section, the end of chapter 1, going into chapter 2. When we come to 127 to 30, 127 to 30, Paul is saying this to us, standing together for the gospel, for us standing side by side or shoulder to shoulder for the gospel is our worthy citizenship. It is our duty as citizens of the kingdom of God to do that. Look at what he says in 127. Only or moreover or first of all, first of all, conduct yourselves in a manner that Greek word is the Greek word for citizenship. Be a worthy citizen. Conduct yourselves as a worthy citizen of the gospel of Christ. Notice, so that whether I come and see you, remember he's in prison, or remain absent, I may hear of what? That you are standing firm. 
standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Notice, please, verse 29, the first word, for, because, to you it has been granted as a grace gift for Christ's sake, not only to believe, as Archie well said, not only to trust, but to what? Suffer. Suffer for his sake. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So Paul is saying to us, as we seek to impact our community here in Granville, as you seek to impact the lives of people that surround you, that see you in the shops, that see you in the stores, that see you on the street. We need to do this side by side. We need to do this shoulder by shoulder. It takes, to take a statement, it takes a church. It takes a church to impact the community. It's way beyond any one of us. And Paul wants us to see that right away. Notice, please, again, this is worthy of the gospel. It's for us to stand shoulder to shoulder. It is our citizenship duty. We need to recognize that as a duty and carry it out that way as we seek to witness to others. But please notice how it is to be done, how, how that unity is described. He says this, you're standing firm. That Greek word is used of a military unit that literally stands shoulder to shoulder, arms held high, ready to defend, ready to do what soldiers do. We are doing the same thing. We are doing exactly the same thing. He says this, standing firm in one spirit with one mind, with one soul, with one spirit, striving. Striving together. That Greek word is the word from which we get athletics. You all know what athletics are like. You all know what the Olympics entail. You see the race, you have no idea how many hours and months and years it has taken these people to practice and practice and practice and practice. It takes the same from us. The same effort, the same intensity for us to stand together, one spirit, one soul, together for the faith of the gospel as athletes, as people who are committed to this task. We do this for the faith of the gospel. And please notice verses 28, 29, and 30. He recognizes, Paul recognizes, as we stand, we stand in a certain manner. We are not intimidated. I like that for the translation of that word. It says alarmed in my translation. We are not intimidated. That's an easy way to see it. In a world where unity has gone out the window, where everybody wants to impress upon you their opinion, where everybody stresses it that they're fighting with us and they're intimidating us, it's easy for us to cower and to say, I can't share with him or her. Look at how they're fighting with me. He says this, as we stand together, as we stand together, one spirit, one soul, intensely standing for the faith of the gospel, we are not alarmed. We are not intimidated by our opponents. Please notice this. Two things about that. It's really kind of a cool statement. It's a sign of destruction for them. They think, they think that as they stand against us, you guys are wrong. You guys are wrong. The whole world is against you. You're on a path of destruction. That's what they think. It's actually for us in the sinful world where we stand for the truth of the gospel and persecution comes on us. It's a sign of our salvation. We're on the right path because the world is against us. We are on the right path because the world is against us. But not only is it a sign of our salvation. Notice what he says in verse 29. I emphasized it to you. For... We're not intimidated because suffering, not only do we believe in Christ, and that's God's grace gift to us, but God's grace gift to us is also that we get a chance to suffer for his sake. Think back in Acts chapter 5, when the apostles are released from prison, and what did they do? Rejoiced that they could suffer for the sake of the name. That's a profound thought, folks. 
a profound thought for us to realize if we are not willing, if we are not willing to take the verbal abuse, to take anything else going all the way up to perish the thought, we would be ostracized, we would be called names, we would be placed in a position where we feel like the whole world's against us. Paul says, if we're not willing to face that, guess what? The gospel does not advance. That's our gift. That's the privilege. That's the grace that has been given to us. And Paul says it takes all of us standing side by side. Side by side, shoulder to shoulder, one soul, one spirit. Emphasizing the intensity of standing for the faith of the gospel. It is standing together for that. That makes us worthy, worthy citizens. Proper citizens. Chapter 2, all the way to verse 30. All the way to verse, verse 30. Says this to us. If you want to have that kind of unity, if you want to be standing side by side, shoulder to shoulder, standing for the truth of the gospel, there's an additional requirement for that unity to be real and deep. And guess what that is? Christ-like humility. Christ-like humility. Let's read verses 1 to 4. Let's just glance through 1 to 4 because I want to spend a little bit more time on 5 to 11. If there is any encouragement in Christ, and the Greek would allow us to say, since there is encouragement in Christ, since there is consolation in the love that we have for each other, since there is a fellowship that we gain from working together with the Spirit of God, since there exists affections and compassions, since all of those things are true, since all of those things are real, since all of those things are available to us in our new relationship with Christ and with each other, make my joy complete, he says. What is that going to entail? By being of the same mind. He said the same thing above. He wants to repeat it here. He wants us to get it again and again and again. Being of the same mind, maintaining or having the same love, United in spirit, intent on one purpose. Paul is emphasizing in this passage this little organ right here in our minds. Over and over again in this passage, four times, he uses a Greek word that is talking about our mindset. Our mindset. We are to be thinking the same thing. Why? Because we are thinking of the gospel. We are to be focused on the same love. We are to be thinking as Christ thought. This mindset allows us, allows us to do what? Verses 3 and 4 allows us to eliminate self-centeredness. Eliminate selfishness. To put it aside. We have all this blessing that we have in our relationship with Christ and with one another. Therefore... We can think this one thing. Therefore, we can have this same purpose. Therefore, we can have this same love. But, but, one of the things about the Christian life is it's just not adding on all these good things to our bad. It is eliminating the bad. If we don't eliminate the bad, we have this mess in our lives where the bad rumbles around and occasionally the good shows up. We need to Reject self-centeredness. Verses 3 and 4. Do nothing. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. The King James says vainglory. I like that. Vainglory. Where we always think about ourselves. Everything we do is about ourselves. Everything we talk about is ourselves. Everything is a, a revolves around us. Paul says don't do that. Don't do anything like that. But with humility, please notice, of mind, again, emphasizing it's up here. It's not just simply in our thoughts. Excuse me, it's not just simply in our words. It's not even in our actions. It's in our mind. Humility of mind. Let each of you regard one another as superior to them. When I preached in the country I used to preach in, 
it was a really big deal. They had a phrase in the language that we use. Who is the greatest? I mean, they talked about it all the time. Who's the greatest soccer team? Who's the greatest wrestler? Who's the greatest politician? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? Everything was who's the greatest. And you live in that, you swim in that, you live in that, and it affects you. Such that it comes into the church. Well, who's the greatest preacher? Who's the greatest church? Where's that? And I would do this. Watch me. I'm going to do something you're going to find rather unique. So who is the greatest in this room? Who is the greatest in relationship to me? All of you. All of you. I regard all of you as superior, so I put my position down here. Down here. And therefore, I don't have to worry about, hmm, where do I fall in the pecking order here? Who is this person in relationship to me? Paul goes on. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests. He doesn't say don't do it. He says don't do it only. Have your focus upon the interests of others. So for Paul, in these first few verses, he is saying to us a very important thing about humility. You have to reject self-centeredness. You have to set it aside. It has to be removed. It can't be all about you and all about me and all about me and all about me such that all I talk about and all I think about is me, 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 me. It has to be others are better. Others are superior. It has to be others. My focus in terms of humility for us to work together in unity is I need to be focused on others. And he gives us a great example we need to think like Jesus thought. We're going to stick here for just a minute. Verses 5 to 11. I want you to recognize something about this passage before we get into it. Because this is a deeply theological passage. One that we go to to defend and to explain and to show people the deity of Christ. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as I try to explain it. But recognize where this passage fits in this context. Paul is not seeking to give a systematic theology of Christ. He's not seeking to give a Christology here. He is saying, Jesus is our example. Think about who Jesus was and is now. What he did in the incarnation and take that as your example of humility. Notice what he says, 5 to 11. Have this attitude, again, we're thinking, thinking words, thinking words, over and over again, thinking words. Have this attitude, have this mindset in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, or could be also translated, those of you who are in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed, and I'd like to change that, he exists, the Greek participle is a present participle, he exists. This is his existence. This is his being. His being is, he is in the form of God. All that makes up who God is, in his essence, that is who Jesus is. That's his existence. All that God is, Jesus is. Who exists in the form of God did not regard equality with God. Notice, please, this is a humility. This is a stance. This is a position. He exists as God in the form of God. Every essence of him is God, but his status as God, his status as God, he did not regard this. He did not mark it down, as it were, make a decision based on the fact that he is equal with God. It is a thing to be grasped. That Greek word, I think, has been well translated by a man named Roy Hoover many, many years ago. I think it's well stated. He did not use his equality of, with God, that status as God, to be a position of advantage for him. Advantage for him. I'm God. I will do everything from this status as God. This is my advantage. This is who I am. Jesus did not think that way. His mindset was not oriented toward that. Please notice what it says next. Because this is where the humility comes in. He emptied himself. He emptied himself. There have been papers written about this. There's been discussions talked about this. There's a whole theology built on this word. 
kenosis, the kenosis, the incarnation of Christ. But he explains what he is emptying himself. It's not his independent use of his attributes. It's not his glory. It's not all those. What did he empty himself? Notice, please, how the passage can be explained. He emptied himself by, by taking the form, same word as used of God up in verse 6, the form of a bondservant the lowest of lows, and being made in the likeness of men and appearance of man, he humbled himself even further by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But it didn't stop there, verse 9. Therefore, because Christ exercised that humility, because Christ, as it were, set aside that status, not the essence, the status, that we would say the pride, I'm God. Why should I lower myself to the earth? No, he set that aside. He became a slave, the lowest of the low. He became a man. Think about people, if you could go above this ceiling, all the way to the sky, that's where Jesus was. He came all the way to the earth as a servant that washes feet. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is he saying to us here? This Christ-like humility. For us to have that Christ-like humility, we need to recognize who Jesus is, who the Son was. All that he had, the magnificence of being in the form of God, and as if he was way up there by the Son, he came way down here to the earth. That's the decision he did. He did. That's the decision he took. How dare we, how dare we do anything like that, in terms of saying, well, me? Me? I'm better than that. Why would I, why would I do that? That takes a humbling, humbled person. I'm not going to humble myself like that. Think of what Jesus did. It takes a Christ-like humility. All that he set aside for us, for us, to come to this earth. Think about what the reward is for him. Pointing people to him is our great privilege. Think about what the reward of humility brings. Paul doesn't stop there. He's still continuing to think about this humility that's needed, this unity that's needed, and he wants us to see and understand what this unity is. We can keep growing in Christ-like character. And as we do that, our humility and our unity is extended. Verse 12 to 17, 18, excuse me. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean our salvation is based on works. It means that our salvation started at a certain point. He wants us to continue to work on this salvation, to continue to take the steps of sanctification that we need to recognize this salvation is a gift to us. We received it. Therefore, in fear and trembling, recognizing this great gift, we continue to work this salvation out. We continue to accomplish, as it were, what God is wanting to do in our hearts and lives. What does that mean? How, do we, how can we do that? For, verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you. God is a worker in you, both to want to and to do his good pleasure. So when we think about this growth that we're asking, what we're going to talk about God is doing everything that he needs to do. He is giving you the want to. He is giving you the will to do it. So all we have to do now is choose to obey. All we have to do is say, yes, Lord, I want to obey. What does that entail? Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. 
do all things in terms of gospel ministry, do all things with regard to church ministry without complaining. You know what the word complaining is, right? It's this type of thing. Someone gives you something to do and you leave. You may think, I'll do it, but you leave going, well, oh, it's me. You should give that to me, not me. I'm better than this. I shouldn't do this job. Someone else needs to clean the toilet. Someone else can do that. that. Eliminate that. And eliminate disputations. Eliminate complaining. Eliminate the types of argumentations. What? You expect me to do something related to the gospel? That's for the pastor to do. That's for the elders to do. I'm not going to do that. And as we eliminate those two things, our unity is increased. And notice how he describes it for us. That you may show yourselves, prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We are appearing, we are shining as lights in the world. We hold fast the word of life. So as we take these steps to grow, as we take these steps to eliminate the things that cause our unity to be broken, the complaining, the arguing, that's when we can shine forth as lights in a crooked, in a crooked and perverse generation. And that's when we, as we hold forth and hold fast this word to people, people will say, huh, huh. He's talking about something that I actually see in his life. There is no mark. There is no stain. There is no thing in his life that I can look at and say, you don't do that. You're telling me to do that. You don't do that. Verses 19 to the end. We're just going to quickly mention those two examples. Because, as I said, this is whole, all one connected piece why does he talk about Timothy? Why does he talk about Epaphroditus? Remember what we're talking about, folks? It is unity for the sake of the gospel. We need that unity, that deep and real unity, and we need to do that because, or to be able to do that, we need to have humility. These two men, when we think about Jesus, I can't be as humble as Jesus, but you can be as humble as Timothy. You can be as humble as Epaphroditus. What does Paul say about Timothy that is so neat? Verse 20. I have no one else of kindred spirit, no one else who is a confidant, who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests. Notice, please. They all being who? People who are serving the Lord. They all seek their own interests. I will come to this church if you give me this amount of money. I will come to this church if you give me this type of a house. I will come to this church if you give me that ministry to do, but not the other ministries to do. No, he's seeking others. Not his own interests. Not his own interests. Timothy was living for others. And please notice Epaphroditus as an example. Epaphroditus, how did he show his humility? What did he do? All of this talking about Epaphroditus being ill and how the Lord had, brought, had shown mercy to Paul, etc. Come down to the very end. Receive him, verse 29. In the Lord with all joy and hold him Hold men like him in high regard. Why? Because he came close to death for the work of Christ. Risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. That's the humility. He was willing to suffer. Willing to suffer. Timothy lived for others. Epaphroditus was willing to take the suffering that the gospel talks about. G.K. Chesterton had this great quote when we talk about humility. He said this, What we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. Modesty has moved from the organ of ambition, I want, I want, I want, and has settled upon the organ of conviction. Well, you know, if you want to believe that, that's okay with you. I, I mean, it's really not that important. I guess this is really not a truth issue after all. Where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself. Doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. The humility has been flipped in our day and age. So when we think about application, how can we apply this? What are some things that you could do this week that you can begin to think about and pray about? Number one, we need a clear, visible, and verbal unity for effective evangelism. People need to see. People need to see. That you live together as brothers and sisters of Christ. They need to see that you are together. In the country that I served in, they had a phrase. 
I can read the air. I can read the air. And you two are not getting along. We can do that here too, probably. Clear, visible, and verbal unity for the sake of effective evangelism. Epaphroditus and Paul, they did not run from suffering. They did not run from suffering. Acts chapter 4, they did not pray that God would lift the suffering. They did not pray, God, give us a different president so we're not going to suffer as a church. He said, Lord, you see what is happening to us. Give us strength to stand and stand for the truth of the gospel. Remember, it's a sign we are on the right path. And it is a grace gift to us to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Humbleness of mind, folks. Humility of mind. We should be able to eliminate things from our phrases like, I, I am right and you are wrong. I am first and you are last. We should be able to say easily, I am sorry. We should be able to say easily, I am wrong. Humility of mind. Humility of mind is necessary for this reality. And continued growth, growth in holiness, is that which helps us to help others. As we continue to grow in sanctification, as we continue to grow in sanctification, the Lord can continue to use us. So, is unity a swear word? I hope not. Because you see, unity is necessary. It is absolutely necessary for the gospel to go forth. Father, thank you for the reality of this chapter and all that it teaches us. I pray, Father, that you would give everybody here steps that they can take, decisions that they can make, emotions that they can now manage in terms of serving you in the gospel ministry. We pray these things in Jesus' name.